welcome to Core Concepts. I'm your host, James Renfrew Powell, and this is a show that we invite religious and spiritual leaders, people who have sometimes been on a tortuous path toward enlightenment, to come and talk to us about their experiences. Uh, tell us a little bit about what they believe, why they believe it, and what they're doing about it. In other words, how is it manifested in their lives? And today, my guest is Sharon Turco. And Sharon, and I'll introduce you to Sharon directly here in just a moment, but uh, Sharon and I have done some work together because she worked with us on, uh, in fact, she was the primary editor of uh, The Mysteries Revealed, which was one of, the, one of the first of my books to be put into print. The Mysteries Revealed was, is a metaphysical interpretation of the book of Revelation. And um, so it was rather a different type of uh, book, and it was a lot of work for Sharon to, uh, to do on that book. And uh, then uh, she went back to school, got her master's in business administration, went to work with FedEx, and I didn't see a whole lot of her. And uh, now she is retired, and uh, during that process, she became a devotee of Sai Baba, made several trips to India, and um, uh, has, uh, I think, a very interesting story about her process. And I would just like to turn the show over to her and let her tell you, everyone, tell you about her process. Okay? All right. Thank you, Jim. And really, I think I have to go back to the beginning to really give an adequate picture of the journey to enlightenment, because it truly is a journey. I grew up Catholic. And as a Catholic, we went to church every Sunday, every holy day. It seemed like we were always in church. But at age seven, I had my first awakening. And my first awakening was my experience with angels. I had a deep connection with angels at age seven. I continued in the Catholic church. And at age 12, I read the Bible from cover to cover. And I really thought I was going to be a Catholic nun. But then at age 13, I discovered boys, and that kind of got on the back burner for a while. But then at age 18, I was back on the spiritual path, and I discovered the Edgar Cayce books. And I read every single Edgar Cayce book that was in print. And I was seeking. I was a seeker. And I... As a result of that, I left the uh, Catholic Church, uh, not officially, but I was searching. So I started attending different Christian churches to experience other modes of thought. And kept searching, and then eventually I found Paramahansa Yogananda, and I studied his self-realization lessons. I did that for three years. After that, I was introduced to the Course in Miracles. And I studied that for 10 years. Uh, for 10 years, every week, I would go to the Course in Miracles lessons. And then all of a sudden, it was like, Amen, you're done. So I said, OK, well, what's next, Lord? And so the next thing that came to me was uh, an Indian man who attended First Unity Church, and he invited me to go to the Satya Sai Baba Center in Germantown. And I went, and when I walked in, even though they were speaking in San Sanskrit and chanting uh, holy songs that I didn't have any idea what they were saying, I felt home. And so I continued going to the center, and um, when I first started going to the center, I didn't have any pictures of Satya Sai Baba. So I asked uh, BJ, who was the person who was having the sessions in his home, if I could have a picture. And he said, yes, you could have a picture. He brought out uh, a group of pictures, and he said, you can have any of these that you want. Well, it's very difficult to choose among a group of holy pictures. So he said, I like this one the best, so go ahead and take that one. I said, okay. So I took that one, and then I'm thinking, OK, 
okay, I have this holy picture, so I need to find the perfect frame for it. So I walked into the store, and as soon as I walked in the store, there was one frame that sat above all of the other picture frames. And I noticed it immediately when I walked in, but I was thinking, oh, I've got to have the very best frame for this picture. So I walked all through the store and ended up buying the one that was up on the uh, top rack. And I brought it home. I put the picture of Sai Baba in there, and I turned it over, and it said, made in India. And I thought, well, that's interesting. But I took the picture, and I held it under the lamp, and I said, Sai Baba, you did a very good job of choosing this picture frame, but these gold stones and metal don't match these silver mirrors. And I took the picture and I put it on my altar. New Year's Eve, I decided that I was going to go to a special um, session in Little Rock where they were going to have budgets and a, a holy person from India had come. So I took that picture with me to Little Rock and I put it on the altar. Well, my husband and my daughter was with me and they were like, oh, mom, it's two o'clock in the morning. We've had enough. So I talked to the owner of the house and I said, well, would it be okay if I come tomorrow morning and I'll pick up a picture at that time? He said, yeah, that'd be fine, come anytime. So I came back the next morning and the picture had manifested the booty and you know, that's quite an honor. But booty is a sacred ash. It's kind of like in the Catholic tradition, the sacred ash on Ash Wednesday. And so, uh, you know, I was feeling uh, deeply honored to have received that gift. And so uh, I was bringing two women who had attended the event in Little Rock back to Memphis. And uh, I was thinking, well, if they get hungry on the way, we're going to have to stop at a restaurant. And what am I going to do with the picture? I can't leave it in the car. I can't take it restaurant you know but fortunately no one said anything about it and about halfway home I went <gasps> and they were like what's the matter and I said Sai Baba changed all of the silver mirrors there were 120 of them on the picture frame from silver to gold so it just proved to me the uh, omnipresence of God because the only two people that knew about that was Satya Sai Baba and myself. And it manifested. And he was in India, and I was traveling from Little Rock to Memphis when that occurred. So we developed this uh, deep connection with one another, and I felt that I needed to go to India. So when I turned 50 years old, uh, that was my request, to go to India. And when I went to India, I was, um, Sai Baba was still in physical form at that time, and I was blessed to have darshan every day while I was there. And all of this time, I was seeking enlightenment. That's been one of my goals since age seven when I felt this deep connection with angels. And I continued working, reading his books, and I think one of the key factors is purifying your mind so that you eliminate all the negative thought from your mind and bring yourself into a love condition, a vibration of love. And then one day, it just happened. It was like, woke up and like any other day, and then I was enlightened. And for me, that experience of enlightenment was one where in Christian tradition they talk about the veil being lifted. And that's really what the experience is when the enlightenment occurred. It's like this curtain goes up and it's like this is what it's all about. We are all, all, all that exists are pieces of God. We're all pieces of God. Everything is a piece of God, or the Creator, or higher consciousness, however you choose to look at it. But for me, it was God. And that all of our lives are the experience. It's kind of like if, if you looked at this body as God, and I'm a finger, or the fingernail. 
and everybody else is part of that whole body, which that whole body is God. And after the experience of feeling that oneness, you just have this immense love for everything and everybody, which you move into a deep love consciousness, recognizing that each and every person that you meet is also an individual expression of God. And I guess that's the culmination of the enlightenment experience for me when I finally recognized the oneness of all that is and sharing that love with each and every person. I think that for each individual, it is a personal experience. I think no two people come to the enlightenment experience the same. I think the destination is the same, but I think the journey is individualized on how you experience it and the path that you choose to take to have that experience in your life. And I think that once you realize that everybody is part of you and you are part of everyone else, you have a different perspective on life. And I think that life then becomes one of love, peace, joy, compassion, and you want to share that with everyone. And I think that the more people who are working towards the experience of enlightenment, the greater the opportunity will be for the world to move from this place of chaos into a space of love. Okay. Do we have now we're going to have some questions where you can I'm sure that Sharon will be happy to talk a little bit more in detail about some of these experiences. So uh, Sharon, I would like to know how has your life changed since you started working with the Enlightenment Center? Well, I'll tell you that the Enlightenment Center is Our existence is a microcosm of that of the, the one. 
So I guess my question is, when, when, when I look at the story of Adam and Eve as it's presented in the in scripture, in the Bible, uh, would you think that uh, Adam and Eve, the story, represents two people? Or is it a story of the creation? And I say that because, and this is my own interpretation, it's not Rumi or Arabi or anybody else, it's just me. But I look at, I look at the, the earth, for example, and I can see in the, in the, in the, in the, in the essence of the creation. I mean, I can see how we are all built pretty much the same way. The, for example, the human body has uh, uh, hair on it, the same way that earth has uh, grass on it. We have bones same way that Earth has uh, all of the, the mountains and things that hold us in place. We have uh, sweat and tears, the same way the Earth has got uh, 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 rain and, and, and things like that. We've got rivers and oceans, the same way the body, the, the Earth has got, uh, I mean, the Earth has got rivers and oceans, the same way the body's got blood running through our uh, veins and, and, uh, and blood vessels and everything. So my point is that we're, it seems to me that we're all part of the same, uh, uh, we look different, but I mean we have the same essence. So the story of Adam and Eve, is it really a story of two individuals or is it the story of the creation of the earth? What, what, what do you, what's your take on that? I mean not just the earth, but I mean all of creation. Well, I certainly agree with you that uh, we are reflections, everything is a reflection of the, the earth individual cosmos, I, I certainly believe that. I think that we are, you know, enlightenment is really about opening up and allowing yourself to connect with God consciousness. So if you, you know, have a lot of negative thoughts, that's not going to happen. So you have to work through all of the issues, all the blockages that you have uh, in your own personal being until you feel that you have um, no negative thoughts, that your consciousness is clear. Because once you have achieved that clarity, that's when you, as, as Jim so eloquently says, that's when you come to know. That's when you come to know who you really are. And that is that we are all one. We are all part of the omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipotent God or higher consciousness, however you view that. And I think that everything that happens is, is a reflection. You know? It's a uh, experience of the oneness in that experience. Can you talk a little bit about presence? Because I mean, a lot of time, on one level, we talk about, you know, I'm a believer, and I, I believe, you know, from I mean, from the, just a, a regular Christian or Jewish or Muslim, you know, belief standpoint, we say that I'm a believer in such such a faith, and, and I follow this doctrine or that doctrine. But that doesn't necessarily mean you are and you're trying to live in God's presence. You say it with your lips, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you actually live. You're actually there yet. At first, I didn't understand that, but as I grow. I, I like to think that as I grow spiritually, I've come to understand what living in God's presence means. Can you talk a little bit about your understanding about that? Well, I think for me personally that as you, you know, there is a journey towards enlightenment. All these things that you have to do before you have received the grace of God to get uh, an experience of enlightenment. But that experience of enlightenment is also a growing experience. You know, it's not just like, okay, we turn on the switch and we understand it. It's also a growing experience. So you continue to evolve and grow and recognize and experience all of the uh, blessings that we have in our lifetime. And I think that from a religious uh, point of view, if we look at all of the different religions like Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, Christianity, uh, all of it, they're all paths to God. 
Right. There, there's not, but there's only one destination. So, uh, in my personal belief, all of the different religions reflect um, the culture, the society of a particular group of people so that God can speak to them. In other words, we in America, we have a certain view and therefore a lot of us are Christians because that's what we followed. And people in India are uh, primarily Hindus and Muslims and so that way of thinking about religion reflects their culture, their society. But the ultimate goal is the same for everybody. The recognition that we're all one. The, the interesting thing is, and she's kind of touched on it, I think, is that the destination is really a, not a destination. It's always the journey. It's always the journey. Everything is the journey. And, uh, and it doesn't matter which religion you come from. You know, we come from uh, essentially Judeo-Christian uh, in the United States talking. Well, the Bible said a long time ago, I mean, anybody who read it, but we don't connect. There's a disconnect on a lot of this stuff when it comes to religion and spirituality. We don't connect it. It says God dwells in man. If God dwells in man, how can we be separated from God? Anybody talking about separation from God doesn't know. You couldn't be separated from God if you wanted to be. But you can be separated in your mind, in your perception that you're separated, that you're evil, that you're bad, that you don't deserve one thing or another like that. That can be possible, but you can't really be separated from God. And, and secondly, the Bible also says that we live, move, and have our being in God, doesn't it? Everybody knows that passage. If that's the case, where's the devil? If God is omnipresent, where's the devil? It's in our minds. Right? It's in our minds. It's in our perceptions. And it's experienced through fear. Fear is which causes the chaos and the problems. Uh, maybe you want to address that a little bit. I mean, in your experience, did you have to deal with a lot of fear in your process? Yes, you, I think you have to go through experiences. It's like if you have this experience, then you, it, it works on developing your level of faith that you know that whatever this experience is, that God is with you, God is helping you work through this experience, God, God is teaching you, and you are learning something that is going to help you later on in your life. And for me, I was blessed to have all those teachings culminate in enlightenment, where you can really understand and know that you are part of God, and everybody else is part of God. It's, it's very uh, interesting if we if you go look at it from a Christian perspective, uh, because of where we are. Uh, the prophets said that there would be one who would come that would reveal the secrets that had been held there, laid hidden from the foundations of the earth. And in Matthew it says that Jesus has come to reveal secrets that had been held and laid hidden from the foundations of the earth. It also said that he would speak in parables, that's tell little stories. Right? And it says that he spake to them in parables, and that without parables spake he not. In other words, he didn't use any other system. And when you look at the teachers, the great teachers, the Buddhas and so forth, they just told stories. Because it has to be on a level that because our ears are dull of hearing and our eyes are closed, <laughs> as he said, <clears throat> it has to be on a level that we can that we can follow and we can understand. And in those parables, you have some really great lessons we don't uh, we don't, we don't think about. And one of them is the parable of the talents, where one is given one parable, one's given one talent, one's given two, one's given five. And two of them do very well, and then uh, the master comes back and he rewards them. And the one who didn't do well, the secret of why is revealed. He asks him, why did you not put it in where you can at least draw interest on it? And he said, I was afraid. So your devil is, is, is revealed right here. Fear. 
And this is why Jesus constantly in the Bible said, fear not, fear not, fear not, over and over again, fear not. And you have the illustrations of Peter walking on the water. Then he sees the storm. He starts to sink. Why? Because he becomes afraid. Right? So you have this. In that same parable, you have uh, the reward. What was the reward for the two who were successful? And this is why I said the journey is always it. It said they didn't, they didn't, unfortunately, they didn't send me two virgins. And they didn't get milk and honey in paradise. And they didn't get any of those things. You know what the reward was? More responsibility. That means even when that journey is finished, the journey is not finished. The journey is ongoing. Anyway, I've talked more than usual for this type of show. Uh, any, um, I want you to ask well, questions of our guests. I just wondered, uh, back to your path and, and how you deal with day-to-day -day events. Say like if, if someone, well you retired now, but say when you were working and you felt mistreated at work and maybe there was anger there. You know, those are everyday things that many of us deal with. How, do you, how did you, after you became enlightened, how did you handle those situations? For me personally, one of the things that I've noticed is uh, after the experience of enlightenment, you don't have anger anymore because you realize that every single person is on their own personal path. And where they are at that particular moment is what they are offering. So if someone is upset about a situation or they can't uh, mentally or physically or emotionally deal with a particular situation, you just offer love for that situation, offer to help, offer assistance, you know. So for me, how I experience it is I, I'm always in a state of peace no matter what happens, no matter what happens just are constantly in a state of peace and when people come in your presence with problems or issues or anger or whatever uh, you just offer love in, in a way that hopefully that person can understand that it's, it's an issue that they are experiencing and you'll help them in whatever way that you possibly can. One of the uh, one of the uh, greatest writers in my mind of recent years is David Hawkins, Dr. David Hawkins. And he wrote Power Versus Force and many other just extremely good books. And he was a psychiatrist, and I mean a very successful one. He's been honored by uh, Oxford and, and all over for, for, his, for his teachings and for his writings. And he describes in the midst of this success in New York City, when he experiences enlightenment, that he was almost like helpless because he's full of love and trust. Uh, he's actually vulnerable for, to, to, to people and he basically withdrew from society uh, for about eight years. Uh, he died uh, last year, I think, in Sonoma, uh, or in, in Arizona. But uh, I thought that that was a, a very interesting thing for me because I know that even though you become aware and and, uh, and have love for folks and, and are trusting, you begin to build the shell back up. <laughs> if you're still doing business or you're still dealing with people, you begin to... you. you if you don't have that uh, little bit of a protection there, then then you're just totally vulnerable. And uh, I thought that was a very interesting uh, comment that he that, uh, and and that whole story uh, about that. The, have you felt that vulnerability yourself, or you're in a more protected situation uh, at home anyway? For me personally, uh, I, I can say that. I, I don't live here because I feel that whatever happens is a blessing. 
I may not recognize it at that exact moment that it's happening, but I'll look at it and I'll say, okay, what blessing is God sending to me now? And then I'll look at the situation and I can always see. It may not be that first day that the experience happened, but eventually, in a week or two, I will see why that experience came to me, which you may look at it from an outside perspective as a negative experience. But it's not, in my opinion, there aren't any negative experiences. They're all lessons for you. Some are just more unpleasant. Than <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's true. Some are, some are more unpleasant. It's like good karma and bad karma. There's really only karma. <laughs> yeah. but, but if it's an experience that you're being forced to learn, uh, you could consider that a, a bad karma. You yeah. could consider it, yes, exactly. You had another question? Well, no, I, I had, it was more of a comment. Uh, when, when things like that happen to me, and I don't claim to be in life, I misunderstand me, but when things like that happen, I, I have the kind of personality, I'm, I'm very rarely upset with too much of anything. I'm really kind of calm, and, but I think that's uh, partly because of the many years that I've spent trying to uh, get to know myself. But when things like that come to me, uh, a friend of mine came to me just recently and she was telling me how things were not going right and she was upset and she was crying and fussing and this, that, and the other. And I tried to uh, explain to her that this was, might, like you just said, might be a lesson uh, from God that, she, that's, that, that is put out there for her to try to get something that might not necessarily be a punishment or even something bad in her life but instead it might be something that she can get something from. Take a look at your life and see what uh, see what you might have done that you need to correct. Something that kind of, you know. But anyway, that, you have to know who you're talking to when you say things like that. Because some people, depending on their, on their uh, level of awareness, if you will, uh, might not be able to relate to things like that. I mean, they're still stuck on this, on this physical, and when you say that you need to look inside of yourself and they get really upset, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I got real issues and I need I don't need to be doing that kind of stuff. And that's when I back up. Because they are not there yet. And you have to be able and I think it's just me. I think maybe you have to be able to recognize because uh, you can't come to people, everybody the same way. Everybody I think is on a different well, most people are on different levels. And when you try to put every to relate to people on the same level, you kind of mess up uh, over the years. That sometimes uh, you might see things uh, as a lesson, but you can't you can't always relate it to other people that's in the same way. Sometimes you have to know when to just shut up and be quiet and just let things kind of you know. Yeah, that's a very uh, good comment because there are definitely different levels of understanding and where you are on that journey as Jim and I have been talking about. You know, if you're at the very beginning of the journey and you're still in the material and you're engrossed in the material world and what the uh, experiences in the material world are bringing to you, and you haven't reached that level of understanding to see it as a blessing or a lesson, however you choose to look at it. And for each individual it's different. No two journeys are alike. And it all has to do with your own personal experiences, your own personal uh, ways of looking at the world. And that's the beauty of it, I think. That, uh, I know I read a book a long time ago. It was written by Jack Hornfield. And he's, uh, the title of the book is After the Ecstasy is the Laundry. And it's a story of enlightenment. He was actually an American who, who went to India and lived in a uh, ashram for 20 years after the ecstasy, living in God consciousness, and then coming back to the United States and he got married and had children and had to do the laundry, the dishes, and go to work and earn money and pay bills and all, all these things that we do on a material level. And I think that that is part of life. Part of life is these experiences that we have every day. The, the, different, the, the difference is how you look at that experience or how you react to that experience. 
you personally. It's an, it's an individual expression of your level of consciousness. Where are you on your journey? David, uh, speaking of, I talked about David Hawkins a while ago, he said that about 50% of those who do receive enlightenment go on. They leave. Leave the body. Because it is a task, a real task, to remain. Right? And uh, there have been Buddhist teachers and so forth who, who have, uh, have elected that we've heard about, you know, that talk that we that we have knowledge of, who who stayed because of their desire to help sentient beings, and um, that's that's uh, I thought was very interesting that roughly about half literally move on at that at that point because it does seem, and if you talk to people who've experienced the near death experience where they've gone out of body most of the time did not want to come back you know you know they 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 they, they what they describe is that that bliss and that happiness and not wanting to come back to this pain <laughs> you know maybe from a car wreck or whatever it was didn't want to come back didn't want to deal didn't want to come back and have to deal with the uh, you know those day-to-day -day issues that you're talking about you know but uh, I believe that these day-to-day -day issues are still a part of that growing, evolving process. And that if we do remain, it's because we feel like there's more that we have to learn and more that we have to teach. And, and enlightenment, like she says, it's not the end of the road. It's just part of the journey. Are there any other questions? I want to thank Sharon for being with us today on Core Concepts and all of you for participating and asking your questions. I want to thank our host again, uh, uh, Ahmed Sharif, who is the owner of the Grinds Coffee Shop where we have been for this uh, two months, or going on two months by the end of this month. And uh, our sponsor is Institute of Applied Metaphysics. You can go to iam-cor.org and visit the virtual campus of the Institute. All of the courses that are offered, the bookstore, there are free books there, the Searcher's Roadmap, the Unity Principles, and the core document are all there available, the Lightways Easy, and want to invite you to go to other parts of, of uh, the Renford Broadcast Network if you're watching us on YouTube. There are six sections here and uh, that include the Bookman show, this show, uh, the Laws of Material Wealth Personal Development Program, Music with Meaning, the audio books, and the Renford Theater. And hopefully you can be with us again next week on Core Concepts. Thank you.